I'm Tom Hogan, the coordinator of the Milwaukee Poetry Series, and I want to welcome you to our reading tonight of Claudia F. Salibi Savage's poetry reading. We are absolutely delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm excited about this reading. We've been looking forward to it for a long time. And Claudia's reading was originally scheduled for June 10th, last spring, 2020. But as we all know, the pandemic intervened and we had to postpone the readings, but not cancel. We postponed. So we postponed it till now. And this reading is the uh, last of our readings that was on our previous season. So we are able to do it, but virtually this time. We're happy to be here at the Willamette Falls Media Center, live streaming this reading. I hope you are all well and safe wherever you are. Thank you for being part of this. I also want to say, before I introduce Claudia, to give some thanks. Some thanks to the city of Milwaukee for supporting the Milwaukee Poetry Series, which they have really from the beginning, and we're in our 14th season, to the Letting Library. We are a committee of the Letting Library. And so great thanks to the, uh, the programs at the Letting Library, to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. Uh, you've all heard me say many times that you don't have something happen unless you have people working on it. And so we're fortunate to have a very active Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. So we thank all of them. And finally, thanks to the uh, crew here at Willamette Falls Media and to Josh, our tech specialist, who is really making all of this happen. The other thing I want to just call our attention to is, as we know, April is National Poetry Month. So Claudia's reading tonight is one of the things we at the Milwaukee Poetry Series are doing to celebrate National Poetry Month. The other thing was our open mic on last Wednesday, April 7th. The video of that reading is going to be available soon and it will be on this same Letting Library YouTube channel. Now, let me introduce our poet tonight, Claudia F. Salibi Sil Savage. Her work appears in print, on stage, and in galleries and explores multidisciplinary collaboration and diaspora. She is part of the performance duo, Thick in the Throat, honey. Her latest collection of poetry is Bruising Continents. And her recent work has appeared in Baum, Denver Quarterly, Columbia, Nimrod, Waterstone Review, and Anomaly. She is a 2018-2021 Black Earth Institute Fellow and has received recognition from UCross, Gentel, the Atlantic Center for the Arts, RACC, Literary Arts, Mineral School, and Oregon State University. Her collaboration, Reductions About Motherhood and Ephemerality with visual artist Jacqueline Brickman, is forthcoming in Columbus and Detroit in 2022. Her poetics are influenced by rapid reading, Alice Col Coltrane, and long hikes in drippy forests. Now, there is something that I can really relate to. Long <laughs> hikes in drippy forests. She teaches and lives with her husband and daughter in Portland, Oregon. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for this evening, Claudia F. Salibi Savage. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> I sort of love, thank you so much for having me here, Tom, and inviting me. And despite the pandemic, it's just really wonderful to be here with you and your wife, Jane. Thank you so much. And Josh, thanks so much for being our tech extraordinaire because you got to always thank the tech people because we wouldn't even be here if they weren't here. So um, I really appreciate it. And the Letting Library in Milwaukee, um, I know Sarah Roller, the librarian, has been coordinating with me, so I thank her. I just want to thank the committee for picking me to come and read to you today. I was going to say tonight. It is tonight. We're there. We're, in, we're after 6.30, so we are officially in evening. Um, I was originally, um, when Tom asked me to come and read to you, I had a variety of pieces picked out um, from my latest book um, that's making the rounds, as manuscripts do, um, about the Syrian refugee crisis and also jazz improvisation. Um, I will be reading a few pieces from that book, but uh, due to the rescheduling, it's one of these things where 
I have been having a tough year like all of us um, and I really thought if I'm going to do um, a reading of this length I want it to be focused more on that feeling of aliveness that hopefully most of us are feeling right now it's really just to feel so grateful that we're here um, and we're alive and that um, it's spring uh, so I'm going to start with a piece um, called Brethren because I'm going to read pieces tonight that are dedicated to the people who have kept me alive this year um, and this first piece is for my dear husband uh, who I met 14 years ago tomorrow this is called mm -hmm. Brethren nothing between you and the deepening sky an unheard note an unheard sigh, a tree's descent too soon. You shiver at the window, lamplit gray. To the moths, you are moon. Ceaseless wings, buoyant kin, allegiance to the bright. Together, we'll face the creek's ferocious tremolo. Twig thunder, mist, together unveil the night <laughs> thank you um, this next piece uh, is one that um, as most poets I have several collections happening at once there's one that is making the rounds and there's another one that's almost complete um, and this one um, Tom had mentioned I have been working on a collaboration with a visual artist um, from Detroit for many years uh, we were supposed to have our collaboration exhibit in Chicago, but the pandemic happened, and then we rescheduled, and so there's been reschedule, rescheduled to find the gallery. Um, but we wrote, um, she worked on visual art in response to many of my poems and vice versa, um, and this particular piece is for my daughter when she was small. Um, the show will be about children when they're little, and the navigation that happens when you're an artist and you have small children. So, this is called In the Evening Alone. <clears throat> there is no hurry, but I hurry. Pump the day through my exhausted heart. Want to be done and want to linger all at once. I inhale the evening jasmine. Touch the flowering lavender. Stop for rain crushed after rain crushed rose till you could crush me too, rub me for scent. There is always time until there isn't, and you wonder why you didn't get out of your chair, out the door, why you didn't approach the night in its damp forgiveness. The clouds would have welcomed one more crimson cheek, one more breathy climb towards the unreachable. My daughter says, is the snow coming in or out, pointing to a picture in her favorite book with frozen ponds where the rabbits skate. Like the tide, I ask? Last month, she cowered before the Pacific's immensity, ran away to make sand castles close to the wind-sculpted hemlocks far from the water's reach. I tell her all things come back to the earth. Shells break and crumble. Seaweed marries driftwood. When we dance, bare feet to wet sand, our heels throb from jumping. I climb the hills above my house alone so she may rest and sort the mystery. My husband soaps a thousand dishes so I may remember the sky. It doesn't care that I am below it. But the ground, I believe, likes to be walked, likes to be soaked by water and petals. I turn around and there is a rainbow, my first in 10 years, over the place I've left, where my daughter dreams the snow's heartbeat, oceanic multitudes, raspberry roses, roses revolving, shells eroding, green on green on green. 
where she imagines herself a cloud above the sea, above my weary heart. She and I, expanding together, absorbing this night, everything. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to take a bit of water because this next one's a mouthful. <laughs> oh. um. So I'm going to read two Sestinas to you tonight because they're fun. And my husband has been super into them lately, composing work for them. Um, they have a real jazz aesthetic, he feels. Um, so this one is also for my daughter. It's called Jumping Moon. <clears throat> She couldn't stop wanting the persimmon globe of promised orange, flaming as her riotous hair, a starlit moon, even in daylight, jumping strands till it went lost behind her ear, lost under her hat, the one shaped like a strawberry or persimmon. She couldn't jump and then all of a sudden she is jumping everywhere to the bathroom as a bunny over the orange <laughs> dropped on the floor, moon-faced and glad to cause the floor to shake again. Riot, the orange-striped cat next door. Didn't we once love silence? Every morning a riot of dollies tossed in oatmeal, ants next to the heater, red blocks and pink socks lost to the couch, underpants thrown, tiny moon rise over the toilet. Mm -hmm. Our neighbor's drums sound tuba squeal and rotted persimmon. Last fall I should have picked those ripe orange lanterns before the squirrels jumped the fence. The telephone wire jumped to shake the tree, twitching tails, chittering riot over ripe fruit, their mouths stuffed with shiny orange, our last chance to feast lost with the Oregon rain. Oh, persimmon, you learn to say, comparing my open mouth to moon. I miss walking through the night by the moon's light not having to run or jump each block, to savor a persimmon slow, each slice all for me, me alone. No riot, no screaming over the sock lost, no explaining why the color orange is orange instead of red, blue instead of orange. So many questions about the moon or stars coming into her room as if light could be lost or planets jump like whirling riots of fruit, the fray of oranges, bananas, apples, one persimmon, the fruit bowl stepchild while we sleep under orange covers grown black in the riotous dark, the moon wanting to jump into our beds as if it were small, as if lost, a ripe persimmon, fat and heavy in our hands. <laughs> so I will, <laughs> I will read um, a piece from my, my book about Syria uh, I'm not going to do too much explanation about this one. Uh, most of the books about Syria are stories of people. Some are from the news, but m most are from my friends who have been working in the refugee camps in, in Lebanon um, for about a decade. Uh, th this uh, war has gone on. Uh, we just celebrated the, the 10th anniversary of the war in March. There is no celebration for war. Um, in this poem, there's a, an Arabic word, amal, which means hope. And this poem is for a man, Bashuru Shikdir, his wife, kidnapped their children in 2015. Uh, she was radicalized, and they were both American citizens, but she took them to Syria to be with ISIS, and she was killed and he has been looking for them ever since. This is for him. You shake your head and get something other than see. Your mother is dead. That much is true. The dark ooze she planted into your soft ears before she left, no matter how you shake, it won't leak out. If you had a mirror, you could search for her face in your own. If you had a toy rabbit, 
you could remember her soft touch. You have neither. You have bombs. That much is true. She told you this would happen, but you forgot to believe or you forgot to remember the dark ooze, earthquakes, your eardrum. When you still your skull, it dreams for you. A thousand stories away, your father imagines lifting you and your sister out of rubble, his palms a second earth. He knows the dark liquid song, but will not join its singing. He has amal enough for the entire battered world. He thinks all it takes is a cigarette break by the young man holding a missile. All it takes is his lips to each of his children's damp foreheads, the kiss making its mark. That much is true. God awake once more in the blessing of his breath. Mm. <clears throat> Um, in my book about Syria, I have a series of, of poems that are just dates. Um, and it sort of uh, has this, the idea is that I used to always write holiday poems to people. I'm sure some of you who are watching have received my holiday poems over the years. Um, I write New Year's poems sort of reflecting on the year before, just specifically to me, um, and what's happening in my life in relation to the world. Uh, in 2012, my daughter was born, but I lost both my mom and my brother to illness within a month of each other. Um, and so you will hear uh, in, in these poems that have a date, um, that sense of loss, it was pretty special that my daughter was born that year for most of my family to have a baby while we were all dealing with such grief. Um, I, yeah, I think when the pandemic happened this year, it was something that I felt really deeply for the people who were losing multiple family members because I remember that I myself at that time being sleep deprived with an infant and having my mom and brother be so ill, you definitely feel as if you're living in a very horrible dream. So my heart goes out to all of you who have lost people, um, who maybe have witnessed neighbors really struggle, friends struggle and family struggle. And I just wanted to do a quick thank you to all my dear friends who are healthcare workers and out there helping us all. So. This is called 2012. It was not what was promised. No rotund rhapsody, roses readying for bloom, more an inner sea to rival any humpback. Plankton, in this case, devouring the whale. There were moments, of course, belly leading seven months in, we trudged up trail and felt the deep yes. We'd blame it on the pale green moss and molten leaves, the rain more mist than rain. Air awakened your cheeks, painted the throat pink, and the juncos married the forsythia with raucous joy. Towards the path's end, we remembered my family's sorrow, that somewhere, some place is always on fire we might dwell on its burning. Or name our girl River. River lengthening the trees. River saving the mountain's light. Scooping the moonrise. River loving a challenge. River. She'll carry us both. And this one is 2013. This is for John. 
too swiftly, the body grows and thrives and fails and goes. And pictures, stories, even touch feel poor relief against 2013, that cruel and able thief. How can we know so soon all that was lost? We kiss. Our daughter has his laugh, her cheeks, eyes from an ancient sun. These gifts we covet, worship as gods, for all the year has done. And this, <laughs> this next one, um, this one's from my sister. I'm going to take a quick swig. My sister Stacy and I, we dealt with a lot that year. Um, sometimes uh, I think I, I find poets really amazing who can sort of process what is happening in the world and immediately engage it from a poetic standpoint. Um, for myself, I tend to mull and really have to sit with things and sort of feel all those feelings. I, it's very, very difficult for me, especially when there's horrific things happening to immediately engage that. I mostly just want to go in a hole, not write, maybe knit, mm -hmm. drink a cup of coffee. I just cannot deal. Um, so this particular poem was written in response to the many synagogues um, that were being, the cemeteries that were being um, desecrated in 2017. It sort of seems ridiculous with everything that has gone on in the world at this point to even talk about that moment. But I do think that sometimes it's really important to reflect on not just pay attention to what's happening with the news as an artist and just flow with that, but instead to really take that moment and step back and say, let me hold this thing that has happened. Let me feel empathy for these people in this moment. So this is for you, Stace. 2017, how we might pray. My sister and I are all that is left. Hats low against January's bite, we walk to our grandmother's grave. She died last year at 102. Under five feet and fierce as a lioness, she outlived almost all of us. Her family in Europe, her father, her mother, her brothers, her husband, her friends, her daughter. The cemetery is an ocean of stone held by leafless trees. Aisle 75, row 12. We find our grandparents, side by side. The blessing and flowers mirrored like their bodies. I'm the only one who can sound out the Hebrew. Our family, a mix of so many faiths, skeptics and believers, pursues their own paths. The thick black letters float from my lips as song. I remove the scarf of deep blue from the headstone, hold my sister's hand, and pray. The two of us, above the two of them. We have no rabbi. My sister recites a psalm. Across the country, our father, newly Christian, reads his Bible for succor. Here, I say Kaddish. I speak to God one way I know. I speak to my grandmother, hoping she might scold my incompetence. Remind us. We tell her story to the sky. We tell her story to the earth. The earth knows. It has taken so many of us. In this cemetery the size of a small city, I am shocked. So many more are left to die. I am also strangely glad. The bones of oaks hold the clouds. Crows cry through blue. The still cold air is solace. In St. Louis, someone will hate this moment of stillness. In Philadelphia, in Rochester, someone will try to kick and stomp and grind our love and grief to dust. 
They forget we are born with everything. Love and grief flow through all bodies as blood. My sister throws herself on the headstone. Wails. Our grandmother holds her up. So I mentioned before that I guess technically I have three books happening, not just two. Um, because th there was a period of time I, I tend to write in large spurts and then there's sort of a fallow period whenever, and there was a period of time where I wrote sort of um, the shell of three books at once in one year. Um, this one uh, is a book sort of in progress about um, the color wheel, my family, my mother was a painter, um, and this particular poem is for her. The series I'm going to read now have to do with, uh, like I said, the color wheel, so they're all named after different colors, mm -hmm. um, this few pieces. Um, yeah, this particular piece is called Cerulean Blue, which is a gorgeous blue and has a great feeling in the mouth to say that word cerulean mm -hmm. cerulean blue obvious robin's egg o'keefe's new mexican morning the distance between austria and ireland ancestral eye <clears throat> the granddaughter you'll never meet the color we thought bloomed the iris while she floated in darkness Great, 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 great someone in Scotland before Lebanon, in Ireland before France, mornings in Colorado when I traded wind for cloud, earned oxygen, thick tributaries, your lungs before the smoke, your lungs after, the dream of your lungs before we knew, cancer being colorblind. You'd want Mary Cassatt in this poem. Rosy children swathed in sky, tended to. Water at their feet, floating. Eyes feasting sea, more and more in your arms. Somehow, we knew your granddaughter would need calm like you. We named her for what carries on. Her bedroom walls periwinkle, vinca. Morning glory, cloud, blue bonnet, borage, cloud, bee lust, cucumber suck, volunteer flocks, cloud. I can't bear another spring without you. Smear my lids with your crushed petal mouth. <laughs> so these next two... Um, are both for cadmium red. One of the things I did in the book was I kind of explored ideas around each color, and sometimes there were multiple. So um, cadmium red is a color I was mildly obsessed to in my mom's painting studio. I always would look at it, and it was just so deep. I tell my daughter, inside us blood is blue, but it leaves us red, dark red, almost maroon, a moon lit by fire. Something shattered then. She asked for another band-aid, another, to hold herself in. <laughs> and this is the second cadmium red. Lips after, in the dark, a pressure mark. In the morning, a bruise but not bruised. Loose maze of directionlessness, fumble. I'm making love to you. A declaration while gesturing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this piece, so there's a piece that if you signed up, Tom sent you um, a piece about my brother called Burnt Umber, which I'm not going to read tonight, weirdly, but I'm going to read this piece instead, because like I said, I feel the pieces I wanted to read, I, I wanted to have some sense of uh, hope or aliveness in them, and this piece does that for me, but it's also about my sweet brother. Um, there's a story about my brother that when he was three, 
because he was older than me, but when he was three um, in Harlem, he was running down the street and he saw a big thing of daffodils and he exclaimed, I love beauty. Um, which, yeah, it's making me weepy even thinking about it, but um, this is called Pink for my brother. I love beauty, rushing the daffodils at three in Harlem, bowing heads, turgid stems, able to absorb life. I bought myself two dozen pink tulips, though it meant beans and rice for a week. Privilege was seeing those petals bend to my kitchen table, open-mouthed, unhungry. Um, thank you. So um, this last one from that series that I'm going to read um, is an intense poem. <laughs> I'm, I'm, do, I, do people do trigger warnings anymore? I don't know. Our whole world is a trigger warning. Um, but this, uh, <laughs> this one uh, is a poem from my, my darling friend Tandiwe, who lives in Tennessee. If you're out there, Tandiwe, if you watch this after, this poem is for you, sweetheart. Um, and this is, the color is black or extremely dark purple. That's what the name of the poem is. <clears throat> First meeting at dinner, my father's new girlfriend says, white lives matter too. I shiver. I don't know who she's talking about. I miss my mother. She would howl at her. I am with my friend Tandiwe. She cries after reading her poem, Slaves Crossing an Ocean. I'll never get over it. Never, she says. For me, the Holocaust. I dream of small children beaten against walls. Their mothers collapsed by gas, bullets, fire, fathers starved, torn. No matter how many books, how many stories I read, I know the real one is more terrible than any Primo Levi, Elie Wiesel, or Gory Graham poem. It is more terrible than the images that replay in my mind in the purpling night dark as I try to sleep. I need to go into my daughter's room again, see the rise and fall of her breath. History flows through us like an undammed river. Damn river. My mother remembers being seven at the movies. My grandmother covers her eyes when the camps are shown. The bodies that seemed unlike bodies, she said stacked and hollow-eyed. Look away, Mom, please, look away. Don't fill your eyes with echoing bones. Tandiwe's poem howls, a boat howling, a boat unable to howl, pressed and pressed. How will anyone stop howling? There is not enough breath in one body for all the missing bodies. There is more breath in one body than the air of the world. If you could see my dreams, you'd hold your tongue, woman. In late summer, we crush blackberries between our fingers. Suck the still, sweet juice. Forget for a second the thorn. So I'm going to um, read two, this next poem is also about my mom. I think it's about my mom. Oh, uh, and it's also weirdly about fruit. I was sort of, when I read that piece about the blackberries and um, I was thinking about this poem, um, and how right in this moment in spring in Portland, I mean, everything is always blooming and wild and fertile anyway. I, just, I joke all the time that the reason I have such bad allergies is nothing ever just ceases, just for a second. Just like stop growing, just stop. Um, so this poem is weirdly about my plum tree and my mom because our plum tree, this plum tree fell over 
in one of the many like fires we've had fell literally fell totally over we propped it back up we stuck it back in the soil and it's still blooming like i mean there's just plums it's just insane so here's to that this is called refusal <laughs> i don't even want them all but when the neighborhood hordes come with their ladders, come with their bags, when they keep the motor running on their cars like a stone fruit gang, <laughs> doors open, grabbing, breaking branches, even green ones, even pea-sized, stripping the lowest fruit, leaving so much smashed, I court greed. Loss of anything right now is intolerable. I want to yell at them, stop! My mother is dead. It is late August. She's been gone for months. They cluster in threes, in fives, efficient devils, skin taut as my girl's infant cheeks, thick beyond imagining, heavy aubergine moons. Two years before, I sent her jam from the harvest. She hid it deep in the refrigerator after one bite, her mind tricking her. My father, convenient thief. Finding it overcome by mold months later, I hid my weeping and tossed it quick. For a second, I imagined her alone with the jar. Maybe the magenta came through despite her blindness. Maybe the cinnamon and ginger tingled her tongue. She had so few secrets left. Once a painter, she would have loved the way they turn purple on the branch and then go somehow darker still. Deep sugar vibration. Ripeness only certain through the flesh's dusty yellow. Ochre. I remember it neglected in her studio. Seemed a useless color, sad almost, muddy. But here in the center of what is mine, it rewards patience. It says, take me into your mouth. When the neighbors return to their homes, I put my daughter to bed, go outside, take the picker to claim as many as possible. The sky refuses me light, grays, swallowing, clouds, roofs, my hands. I take aim at the top ones. I won't give up on them. Those plums picked at by crows. Burned plums, rotting plums. Plums battered by wind. Those plums, most like me. <clears throat> So I am, I am going to do the obligatory two quick poems from my book, my 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 book, um, Bruising Continents, and um, yeah. So this book, uh, it's just a series of long sequences, and um, so I don't have individual titles on them. So I'm going to read these two little these two little pieces um, from the section called Circadian, and. Um, uh, this book was written um, when I uh, was leaving my first husband and falling in love with another man, who's my husband now. Um, and uh, I was dealing with the combination of being elated all the time and having severe grief, which is very strange. Um, so I will read these two little pieces from Circadian. Only granite could bookend my star-flung shadow. That night I walked the steepest face by moon. The wind ripped at my eyes, so I shut them to claim odd names. Teresius, Inanna, consonants off the pebbles of my teeth. Almost there, a turquoise butterfly's wing beneath my foot locked in snow. Not now, I thought, but picked it anyway. In the dark universe of my left palm, it thawed. With heat, it trembled. I'll call you beauty. The wind wouldn't get everything. I would be the sea, the color of new eyes. 
I would bear down without froth, without fury. I would stop. So sick of how we grow thirstier. Oh, to be a winter tree when the sap slows. Bittersweet shiver. Unquiet this life. Thank you. And so, um, Tom, I don't know if we have, do we have time for a final piece? Are we good? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, um, this piece, uh, yeah, um, I want to read this because it's the only thing I've really written in 2020. <laughs> um, yeah, I've edited a lot, but writing has been difficult for me. Um, and I will just say that if you want to hear this poem, an EP just came out from the Portland Jazz Composers Ensemble um, with my husband's competition, composition, not competition, composition. Um, and uh, you can go to the uh, PJCE's website, pjce.org. So I want to thank Doug Dietrich of PJCE for encouraging me to write something in 2020. And I will read this. This is my final piece. <sighs> it's pretty much for all my Portland people, all the people who kept me going. My daughter says, tell me what you love, tell me what you miss, tell me the truth. This morning I hear my husband explain the equinox to our daughter, using an orange sodden on one side from neglect. I'm in my bedroom office again, rectangular first thing in most of the day, edgy and flaky in equal measure. Even coffee cannot fully fix my alluvial throat, sticky with tears that tear its borders, grateful for the dark liquid that burns. Coffee as lover. We buy from Portland's Nosa Familia, the salacious sounding Portuguese language like peanut butter fudge in the equinox of my tongue. Some mornings I follow a Brazilian aerobics instructor sweat alluvial between my breasts. I don't think I'm supposed to talk about sodden breasts in a holiday poem, but 2020 was a year without rules, kindness flaking from so many skins, murderous, egomaniacal leaders and neighbors who weep, putting up giant rectangular signs to declare the worth of those who were always worthy. The world is even madder than usual. Rectangular borders trying to make us shut up and disappear. In an obscene world, I'll share more salacious stories than usual and tell you about the strap-on my friend showed me on Zoom. Her birthday present flaked the digital air to sparks, anxious to equinox an unknown sphere, caress the sodden center of her girlfriend. This is a terrible holiday poem. Feel free to throw it away. Or maybe... I've made you laugh, your face slicked with good tears for once, salty alluvium. Consider it your nine months of detritus, a disappointment, disbelief, birth of all that needed to become alluvial past, snakeskin recovery for the new year. I give you permission to spit in the rectangular sink of choice, even the floor. I clean all the time now. No one comes over. The bathroom and floor are sodden with soap I imbue with magical properties, though my spells are as weak as my salacious co-written romance novel. Sexy bits, yes. But more of a romp with someone who loves your equinox softening, your hemispheres widening to continental drift. My daughter loves the word flaky. To her, it sings of croissant more than lack of sense. Buttered layers that flake and crisp under heat's command. Maybe this poem can be saved. Maybe alluvial is my favorite word because it is a coalescing, a gathering of strong particles. Maybe we're at the equinox of our lives, rebalancing where we feel our world's heaviness our rectangular bare feet trusting the earth before the toes engage. I'm due to make a salacious joke again, but it is hard in a raging sea of loss to care about being sodden, let alone what it takes to get wet. 
I'll share that this year I cried every day. My daughter too. Her sodden cheeks pressed to my chest. She didn't want me to go to the protest where historical buildings flaked their sides to honor our rage. We were a fire within a fire. Last month, a fellow parent told me her salacious story about a gas mask worn to bed after it was worn to protest, then through the fires. We were alluvium, the black ash of history, the air removed from weakened lungs, the lush Oregon hillside cleaved rectangular, so hot nothing can return. We are scraped sky now, aqueous knocks, Say it, it sounds even better than equinox. We are equal night to the sodden day. Strange to pray so hard for rain when sunlight is the only alluvium my body craves. This year I want round sunflakes instead of chocolate coins for Hanukkah. I want everyone to be safe. I want everyone to live. Place your palms on the equinox of your body. Abandon rectangles. You and your round lusciousness deserve to rejoice in the salaciousness of your choosing. Please be well. Go on and on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom. <laughs> Brulean blue, <laughs> cadmium red. Oh. 2020, a year without rules. Yeah. Just some of the many, many images mm. that come to my mind. Thank you so much. Thanks so Claudia, much, Tom. For you being here and for reading, yes. for sharing your poetry. It's exciting. I said earlier that we waited a long time for yes. the reading yes. because you were originally scheduled back in uh, June but now April, yes. 10 months later, we are having it. So, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. I forgot to say earlier that we were going to have a question and answer. Yes. So we are having Q&A a bit. Okay. And I'm ready. I'm reading... <laughs> There are a number of very complimentary things on the chat. So oh, that's so nice. I, we're going to give the chat. We're going to make sure that you get the comments that were made. Oh, thank uh, you. On the chats afterwards. If there's anyone that has a question for Claudia that wants to include it on the chat, then we will try and take that. You talked about your book, Bruising Continents. Yes. I'd like to ask you about the collaboration that you developed and just to say a little bit more about that if you would with with, with the my artist husband. yeah with the artist Jack, Jacqueline Brinkman oh and with Jacqueline that, Brinkman yes yeah, how that how <laughs> that developed and what's that about I think um thanks for asking about that because we're, we're excited for it finally to come to fruition <laughs> Um, Jacqueline is somebody that I met at an artist residency in Wyoming many years ago. Oh my gosh, 15 years, 14, 15 years ago. Um, and I was completely blown away by her work. Uh, she is not the kind of visual artist whose painting you will put on a wall. I would call her a conceptual artist. Um, she loves working with the natural world and natural materials. She was actually at the residency to construct all these animals and fill them with corn as a result of showing how we're made up of more corn than anything else with corn feed. I mean, it was unbelievable. I remember her saying, can I go to a slaughterhouse and get a bladder, a cow bladder? I mean, she's a wild woman. So um, after, after our residency, um, she married and, and subsequently has three children, um, and I had my daughter, and we talked a lot about uh, the complicated world of working, raising children, making art, how do we do this, what are we doing? Um, 
and I would regularly send her, I send, there's a couple of visual artist friends of mine that I send work to, just because I, it's thrilling to get things back from them, like uh -huh. to get a painting in the mail or yeah. a little something, a sketch, it's just, it's the best. Um, and so she started doing these wild things with her children's toys and saying, can you do something with this? What do you think about this? And I said, Jacqueline, this is like a, we should do this. We should make this happen in some way. Um, and at the time she was, uh, she had opened a studio with several other artists in Detroit called, called Butter Studios. You should look it up. It's fabulous. It's all women and they're amazing. They do amazing stuff. Butter, Butter Studios? Butter Studios, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we talked and we shared a lot of work and we got really excited and um, she's very, she has a very academic mindset, which I do not have, and she did this whole thing and we started sending it out to galleries and we got accepted to a gallery in Chicago, but then um, that gallery folded. You know, COVID has been oh, yeah. just rough on, uh, on the world. So now we're, we're sort of, right now we're kind of poised to, to do a couple places in the Midwest and I'm gonna pitch someone here in Portland to see if we could bring, cause getting her out here, you know, oh. she has a lot of large equipment. So we have to sort of figure out how mm -hmm. it's not a situation, you know, to get a visual artist to come out, you're like, do you put them on a plane with all their weird stuff, or do you <laughs> make them drive in a van? I don't know. So we'll we're working through that, but yeah. um, we want something that's very interactive with children yeah. to be involved, and that's sort of our yeah. vision. Yeah, to be able to have them actually interact with the art. She, her children regularly make things with her big, huge installations, and. Yeah, we want people, adults to feel like kids and kids to feel free to touch everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, in process. In, yes, in process. In process. In process more, for more maybe come. 2022. Yeah. Wow. Well, pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a couple of things from the chat. Uh, Liz Nakazawa says, Claudia, you have knit us all together tonight in the fabric of your beautiful poetry. Oh, Liz. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. It's so weird. I'm looking at the... I don't know where to look. Liz, <laughs> I yeah. send that to you. It's right out there to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Ann, Paul Ann Peterson said, Aww. thank you, Claudia. Thank you, MPS, for this resonant reading. So kind. Thank you, Paul Ann. I look forward to yours. Yay. So good. Yes, Paul Ann's going to be here in a couple of months. So good. Andrea Hollander said, thank you, Claudia. Aww. Thanks so much. Thank so, you, Andrea. Yes. Who are you reading? Right now? Why don't you talk about who you're reading and oh. who you feel have influenced you um, in your work? Well, uh, through most of the pandemic, I was reading Syrian memoirs, which I don't recommend. <laughs> uh, mm. Horrendous. Um, but in terms of poets, that feels more constructive in this moment. Um, I uh, am a huge fan of Douglas Kearney's work, um, and he had a new book that just came out from Wave Books, who I love. Wave, if you're out there, I love you. I love the work you do um, in Seattle. He has a book called Show, which I just got in the mail. Um, S-H-O, not S-H-O-W. I'm always spelling because you know I have an eight-year-old. Um, I'm also <laughs> I'm making my <laughs> I'm making my way through Wanda Coleman's work um, because, as I mentioned, I'm working on this this book about motherhood and and um, other things of that nature. And um, I'm reading her book uh, Mercurochrome, but pretty much anything in Wanda Coleman's. She is snarky and irreverent and brilliant. I mean, I've read all her essays, and I just wish I had as much courage as her. I'm trying, Wanda. You're not around anymore, but huh. I still hear you. Um, and then a friend of mine just sent me um, the new book by um, Khaled Matwa, um, Fugitive At Atlas, about Libya. Um, I think that just came out. Oh my gosh, I can't remember who the press is. My brain. Anyway, um, yeah, Fugitive Atlas. Uh, he's just... Um, a gorgeous poet anyway, and it looks like there's a lot of really interesting, beautiful um, Arab forms in the book, so mm -hmm. I'm excited. Um, when you ask me who influences me, I, I am yeah. I'm very in influenced, I think, by uh, poets who, I think, uh, 
tend to be more performative. It, I definitely read a lot of lyric work as well. I pretty much read everything, but I think I am drawn more to those poets. I am. When I was younger, I, I, Lee Young Lee was was definitely a touchstone for me. Um, and as I've gotten older, I still adore his work, but I think I prefer people who are louder, both on the page and off the page as people. Um, again, it has nothing to do with like not adoring him, he's phenomenal, but it's more the people that really get me excited, like Douglas Kearney, are the people who see their, there's a thinner veil maybe between the performative and the written. Maybe uh -huh. that's the word to say. Uh -huh. um, I heard Terence Hayes once say, He's like, is it made for the page or is it made for the air? Well, to me, I'm always thinking about both simultaneously. Huh. Huh. You okay. know, like, can I memorize it? What would it be in the body? Yeah. How would it sound? What's happening? Um, I always talk about Alice Notley. I've written m many pieces about her. She's someone, actually, when I met my husband, I was studying with her at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. I think she's someone who just embodies that sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. She's also one of those poets that I just feel like they could never give her enough awards. Be, as a woman at the time, you know, she's in her 70s, so I feel like she was coming up at a time where she was overshadowed by her husband's. Um, I'm talking about the larger world. I'm not talking about people who knew her. They knew how yeah. brilliant she was, but she's somebody that to me, I just want people to read her work. She is she wrote phenomenal work about her husband dying of cancer, Douglas Oliver, and, and watching the Iraq war unfold. And I think that political enmeshment in the personal is only effective when somebody has intense craft. Mm -hmm. I, I really, and heart. Mm -hmm. I, I just, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So. It fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That, You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I could name a million. I mean, there's so yeah. many people I read, and yeah. and I, you didn't even. I didn't even get started on all the Portland people. I mean, I'm yeah. reading. I'm reading so many of your books out there. I, I am. I'm reading. I have a stack. Yeah. Well, we have a couple more questions for yeah. you. Yeah. So I'd I'd like to pose an idea too. Sure. That if you would like, we close with a poem. Uh, oh. So if there's one more poem you would like to read, we have a couple oh. more. We have a couple more questions okay. for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we might end with a poem if you'd like to do that. Sure. Um, okay. I, you, could yeah. be th you could be thinking about it. I will think about it. Yeah. I will think about okay. what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if there's, is there anything you want to ask, mm. Claudia? Well, I wondered, I, am, I was just immersed and loved your poetry oh, and the way you, you presented them. And I, I wondered how you got started writing poetry. It sounds like you've been, that you just, it just has to come out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I was, you know, it's funny, now that I've had my daughter, I appreciate that question because I think it's the kind of question you can ask a poet every year and they might give you a different answer. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter, watching her, she's, she's really reading now at eight and um, she had a bit of struggle with, the, I, I mean, I think she had the language, but she had a bit of a struggle. Um, I cannot remember a time I didn't read. I was reading probably at four, and the only reason I mention that is because I think language was something that just kind of clicked in my brain very early and wanting meaning in some way. I think that the combination poetry for me sat satisfies something, like I was saying, I, I, I'm very drawn to people who I feel um, have some kind of heartbeat in their work. That it's not um, necessary. I mean, I read a lot of really lyric stuff tonight because, you know, that's what I wanted to read. But I think I've, I'm very drawn to the musicality of language and poetry. Um, and that probably comes from the fact that I started playing piano at four as well. So I think the music and the language were happening at the same time. And I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about that until my daughter was starting to read. And I realized, oh, she doesn't have this other, like these things aren't maybe happening. Like she's not maybe hearing it the way I heard all those things happening, at, coalescing. Mm -hmm. um, also, the only other person who writes poetry in my family is my sister, Stacy. Hi, Stace. And um, so 
so it was one of those things where a lot of my family members were like, what is this? Why? And I think it's good to have those like little secret mm. things. So <laughs> <laughs> the code that nobody understands. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, here's a question I had for you. Sure. And Claudia and I have been exchanging emails to set this up. <laughs> yes. And in her salutation, you say, you describe yourself as poet, performer, teacher, provocateur. Yeah. That's a new one. Why don't you tell us about the provocateur? Well, I mean, you, 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 you heard, Tom. I mean, I, I you know, I, I guarantee, I mean, I'm not saying, Pauline, if you're out there, like, I'm just, this is my, you know, challenge to you. Like, I think I might be the only poet ever in the Milwaukee poetry series that mentions a strap-on. I'm just saying that I think I probably am. Um, I, I think as I get older, I want the art that I make, I want it to open people up in some way. I want it to poke them a bit, and not in a, a, a nasty way, but just I want people to have a visceral reaction to what they're experiencing, whether it's content or um, sound or whatever it is. Um, I just, I want that abruptness. It's part of the reason I think I fell in love with my husband. Um, he's a phenomenal performer and just, uh, yeah, heart on the floor. Um, so I think I think that's it. I just, I think that that's what we want. I mean, right now, everything's provocative. I mean, my gosh, it's just like, mm -hmm. <sighs> between the news and just walking down the street, I mean, it's just people are uh, totally on edge, I think, as a result of the pandemic and the social unrest. Everything's just coalescing, you feel this thrumming. So perhaps I don't have much to provoke in this moment, but I hope to provoke later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a good way to explain it. <laughs> and you, want to, you, you use the word poke. Yes, uh, yeah. po just gentle poking. Like gentle, like wake up a little. Just, yeah. just a little. Just, wake, wake, you know, up, wake up a little. Wake up. And, mm -hmm, and, a little. and listen to what's being said. Yeah, yeah. And, and empathize maybe yeah. with the world. Because mm -hmm. it's very... This pandemic has both illuminated a lot of things right, but also made us so, understandably, so kind of sure. isolated and, and boxed in, we can't sure. help but feel that okay. way, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, while Claudia is picking which poem oh. she's going to end with, <laughs> I want to say that coming up, our poet next month in May is going to be the Poet Laureate, Anis, Mo Anis Mojani. Yes. Paul Ann sure. Peterson is going to be here in June, and Emmett Wheatfall is going to be here in July. So we are looking forward to Get all of those. Some lineup. You have this is, this is National Poetry Month, too. So we want to wish everybody oh. a happy National Poetry Month. Read poetry, write poetry, yes. listen to poetry, <laughs> experience yes. poetry. We, Jane and I just saw an article in the New York Times which was talking about the importance of poetry. And I think this is something we know, but he was putting it out there to everybody that poetry is a way of expression and it connects us. So both of those things are, are true and we're bringing that more into more clarity in National Poetry Month. So let's hear a final poem from our poet this evening, Claudia F. Salibi Savage. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I will read this. Um, this is one of the first uh, poems I wrote in my book. Um, I will just read it. It feels hopeful, um, maybe for all of us. Like a recent widow, all he saw were billowing flames tonguing the wind as prayer flags. All he smelled were a thousand bodies crushed in heat's anvil. He forgot there is always another story. Look to the seed, a hundred years in soil, its faith in fire, to split the body inside the body, burn to color, Lazarus as name. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thanks so much. And I want to invite everybody here who is watching to give Claudia a hand, as we have been here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> to the, the studio camera, audience I bow. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night. Be safe.
clip.